<laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. All right. Hello, everyone. Okay, this is exciting. We're, I think we have mastered our technological issues, which is so exciting. So, yes, I think hi. so. And thank can you hear that? I'm, uh, I'm just double checking um, on our feed just to make sure. I know that's what I was, I was gonna go to you too, make sure that. Oh, we're live now. Perfect. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> okay. Yay. Look at us. We have mastered technology. We are both here side by side in our own separate living rooms. So this is fantastic. Cool. Well, I would love um, to invite folks to please um, you know, add a like or drop a comment. Let us know that you're here and watching. And uh, we will, uh, Mary, do some quick intros again uh, if we have folks who don't know us yet. And then we'll get to talking about our topic of the day, which is tongue ties. So, um, you know, as you folks are watching, if you want to, um, you know, drop your name. Um, and if you have had any experience with a tongue tied baby, you know, maybe let us know, share some of that info. Um, if you have any questions about tongue ties, feel free to put that in the comments and we'll try to address that um, as much as possible. I um, I apologize, this is the funny part about technology and doing these things from home. I just realized my fan is really loud and distracting to me, so I'm gonna go turn it down. I'll be right back. Okay, no Mary, If you wanna start. Um, yeah, questions? you know, the the funny thing is, I uh, on my screen I can't see you, Elizabeth, <laughs> but I know you're there, so I'm happy. As long as uh, we can both be seen. Um, hi everyone, my name is Mary Conception. I'm a breastfeeding peer counselor at Open Arms, and my focus community is the Pacific Islander community. Um, where should I start? So I have, I'm a mother to three daughters. I have twin girls that are about to be 17 next month. And my youngest is um, 12 years old. So we're all home, um, quarantining, homeschooling. Um, the, so the reason I became a breastfeeding peer counselor is um, I just, with my twins, um, I knew I wanted to breastfeed. I actually wanted to have a natural birth, but because I was having twins, um, that wasn't possible. Uh, and I held out as much as I could until my doctor was like, um, it's, it's been hours. I, do you want to have your babies? So um, anyway, uh, yeah, so my breastfeeding journey began there. Um, I had a lactation consultant uh, visit me at the hospital and then I believe she did a couple more um, visits at home um, and I I got the hang of it while she was there um, you know it was it was this, it had its challenges uh, and the reason why I became a breastfeeding peer counselor was because um, I be who you needed when you were younger right so I I I remember the challenges I had and I wanted to help um, other parents um, navigate through those challenges. So um, I was lucky enough to sit in on one of Cami Goldhammer's um, indigenous breastfeeding courses, her foundational courses. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is what I want to do. And um, I took a class. I actually was in the same class as Elizabeth. And um, now we're here. So I don't know, Elizabeth, if you're back. I can't see you. All I see is the screen. So if you're back, just oh, let yeah, me know. I'm here. I'm here, and I can see you. So you can. Okay, great. I guess um, <laughs> yeah. So you can't see. I was making very supportive faces, uh, <laughs> but I'm totally here. So um, so yeah. So hi, I'm Elizabeth. I am also one of the Open Arms um, breastfeeding peer counselors. I've been doing professional lactation support for about the last five years. And um, I 
I started also much like Mary because I had a difficult journey with my first baby. So tongue ties feature very prominently in my uh, breastfeeding, um, in my breastfeeding Sorry. journey with my daughter, well, both my kiddos. And really the, um, the difference was uh, the knowledge and education and support that I had from the first journey to the second journey made a huge difference. So with my, my both my kiddos are tongue-tied, we're tongue-tied. Um, they've both been uh, revised since birth. And um, so they, um, but with my daughter, uh, I didn't even know what a tongue-tie was. I'd never heard the word. Yeah. So it was, um, it was a whole thing. I was like, I just expected, I figured birth could be hard. I mean, it, I mean, it just, we know that, right? Like there's right. this head coming out of <laughs> a spot that is less <laughs> head sized usually. So, <laughs> um, but I, I didn't expect um, to meet any challenges breastfeeding. Um, I'd read a bunch of books and I thought I knew what I was doing and, um, and I kept putting this baby on. And by the second night, um, my nipples were, you know, bleeding and chapped and blistered. And every time she was nursing, I was hearing this clicking sound. And I, I saw the um, hospital lactation and all the nurses um, said that they knew about lactation. So of course I believe them. And they said, just keep doing it. And I got the, um, you know, the typical, um, that's a perfect latch um, from them. So I was like, well, I don't know. I mean, it still hurts. So I really internalized it as I was doing something wrong. Um, and I shared a little bit last time about, um, you know, just that we had a difficult journey, but really it was, um, I mean, it was, it, <laughs> I always, I don't like to share my story with folks who are pregnant or haven't started nursing yet because I don't want it to scare folks <laughs> off. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, we, we went through a lot of um, weight loss uh, because so my daughter also had some other complications. She was having um, some seizures and she had a heart condition. So uh, we spent some time in Children's Hospital after she was born. And um, so she went to we were in Children's Hospital with her and she uh, was on fluids. And so I, I felt very reassured because I knew that they were, uh, you know, weighing all of her diapers and they were t uh, checking her weight. And so uh, when we left Children's Hospital, she was up like six ounces from birth weight at day five. And I was like, this is great. She's, you know, this must be working really well. It was not working really well. She was gaining weight because she was on so many fluids. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we went home, um, we, she started losing weight, but we didn't know because since she had been at Children's Hospital, um, you know, we kind of fell through the cracks. We didn't, uh, we didn't see our pediatrician again for another, I think another week or two. Um, but we did see the cardiologist and the cardiologist was the one who was the first person who actually noticed that we were having a hard time um, oh. because I just kind of was like, I'm just gonna put up with this pain. Um, and she nursed around the clock. Like she almost was never not latched. And okay. so, um, yeah, and, which makes sense now knowing what I know, yeah. Um, she was just barely getting, you know, we were just keeping what milk she could um, pull out. Um, but in order to keep enough to even just survive, um, she had to be nursing all the time. And so we were at the cardiologist. And, um, you know, I knew that I wanted to be breastfeeding and I was, I had heard about people getting hassled for breastfeeding. And so I was a little bit defensive and I'm at the cardiologist and he says, how's breastfeeding going for you? And this guy's like a hundred, um, he's very old. <laughs> and so, and, and no, no shade to him for being old. He, he ended up being one of my favorite people, but yeah. I had kind of assumed that he was this older guy that he was gonna be resistant to, um, mm -hmm. to breastfeeding. So I immediately like had my hackles up and I was like, breastfeeding is going great. It's fine. Everything's wonderful. And he's like, so you've been here for quite a few hours. And every time I see you, you're, 
nursing. And I said, yeah, that's my right. I can nurse her anywhere. You know, <laughs> she's hungry. She needs to eat. And he's like, yes. I also noticed that you're like hunched up in pain. You seem very uncomfortable, um, you know, and if breastfeeding was going well, we wouldn't expect her to need to be, you know, nursing all the time like this. And I was like, what do you mean? It's not always supposed to hurt like this yeah. and I should get breaks. What? <laughs> and um, right? so then, <laughs> From, from him. Sorry, Mary, what was that? Oh, sorry. Um, also, he was. Yeah, no, I wasn't. Office, right? So you wouldn't expect to to hear that from him. I mean, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> no, I wasn't expecting. Uh, I didn't. I didn't anticipate that he would be actually the guy who finally, after lactation consultants and people at Children's Hospital and whatnot, he was the the person who identified that we were having a, a problem. Yeah, and uh, he was the first person to really listen, and so then we ended up talking. He's like, "Well, this sounds like you need some help," and we went, um, and then it, it we discovered that her weight had dropped, so she had been born, um, and then had gained weight steadily at Children's, but again, that was because she had been receiving fluids, and then when she was two weeks old, she was under birth weight again um, because she had lost all that extra fluid weight and wasn't gaining from nursing. So uh, we then um, got referred to a lactation consultant. We went to uh, my daughter's pediatrician and uh, she almost immediately was like, nope, breastfeeding is not working. You need to um, go get formula, which, you know, feed the baby. That's the most important thing. But, um, you know, I had to really fight to preserve our breastfeeding relationship. Um, and one of the things that I have, I feel is, I feel very strongly um, is recognizing too that we, if we're while we're working out those problems, um, if we're identifying a challenge, it's um, you know sometimes folks get pushback about um, supplementing or hearing that you know or they're worried they're worried that this is going to ruin their breastfeeding relationship, and the thing is it's the most important thing is getting food in that baby, and yeah. when we are able to get food in the baby, then that baby can get bigger and stronger while we're working on that relationship. So I always want to reassure folks that, you know, you're not harming your breastfeeding relationship. You're doing what you need to do, feeding your baby. And, you know, that folks should never feel guilty about feeding their baby. Yeah. At yeah, all. About <laughs> in any way, yeah. shape. That's the goal. Yeah. To get the baby. Yeah. This baby's fed. And for us, my daughter, um, Fiona and I, it took us four months um, before she got to have her tongue tie revised because at the time here um, in the Puget Sound area, there wasn't a lot of resources for it. And so I'm really grateful that now we have a you know wide variety of really wonderful providers we can refer folks to. Um, and the difference was just night and day uh, between um, nursing her before she had her tongue tie revised and after. Um, I mean, we really, we struggled. Uh, well, so we struggled for a while. Um, the whole four months before she had her revision done uh, was was very, very difficult. And then it took some time. Um, the pain went away almost immediately uh, once yeah. she had the revision done, uh, which was incredible. Uh, but because we had been nursing inefficiently for so long, um, it took a while for my milk supply to come back up mm -hmm. um, because a tongue-tied baby cannot, well, many tongue-tied babies, not all, um, but many tongue-tied babies cannot nurse effectively because the, um, the tongue can't create that vacuum that it needs to. Um, and so when you are nursing ineffectively or pumping ineffectively, it affects your milk supply. So um, like many people, my milk supply had gone down really low. And once we got, and I still, I was pumping and I didn't respond really well to the pump. And then um, nursing a baby who didn't nurse well. Um, and so then, um, you know, she had the revision done at four months and we had our first day where I was able to nurse her 
um, without any supplementation and she was satisfied and she was happy. Um, came about a week or two after her revision um, and it was mind blowing. Like I offered her a bottle and she didn't want it. And that was the first time that had ever happened. Um, and it wasn't immediate, you know, so that happened one day, then the next day she still needed some supplementation and that was fine. Um, and, you know, we kind of had this up and down thing. It was not linear. Um, but by the time she was six months old, I was able to nurse her at breast completely. Um, she was satisfied. My milk supply had ramped up to meet her needs. And then, um, so yeah, then, um, from six months fo going forward, I still needed to supplement uh, what I pumped. I never really pumped enough to uh, match what she needed when I was away at work. Um, I don't know if it was just my body and that pump or who knows what, um, but we used donor milk for the rest of, um, until she was a year old. Um, and But I could nurse her if she was with me and she ended up nursing until she was almost two. Um, so we had a very, a very long and fulfilling breastfeeding relationship, even with all the challenges. And if anything, it actually felt like, um, it felt more like uh, triumphant uh, because I was like, oh my gosh, like what we made it through. Um, and it's yeah. kind of funny because our, <laughs> um, when she, when I was pregnant with her, I had read all the stuff and I'd heard, okay, it's best to nurse a baby or for them to get breast milk through one year. And when I was pregnant with her, I could not imagine that. I was like, a year? That is like, that's a toddler, gross. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and then, but, um, you know, at six months, we were still just barely getting the hang of it because I had kind of said to myself, let's just make it to six months and then we'll evaluate. Um, and at six months, we just barely figured it out. And so I was like, okay, you know what? I get it now. Six months, this is definitely still a baby. I'll, I'll nurse her till a year. And then we got to a year and I was like, well, first of all, you're definitely still a baby. Um, my sweet, sweet baby. And nursing is like the most, was the best time that we got to spend together. It was very, she was, she was such a little booby baby. She was so snuggly. Um, and uh, so at a year, I looked at her and I was like, how am I supposed to cut you off now? You know, like this is our jam. We're so like, this is this is our hangout time. This is our comfort. Uh -huh. This is, you know, everything. And then it was extra great realizing that there was no pressure anymore. So even with nursing her after revision, I still was always stressed out about milk supply. Like, is this enough? I have to pump during, um, while I'm at work. And I had, at the time, you know, I had to go pump in a bathroom and a restaurant and um, it was very, very stressful. And then we hit a year and I was like, what? No more stress, just, you know, just you eat up. food. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> and you nurse when you want to and I don't have to pump. This is brilliant. And so then we just kept nursing until, um, until we didn't and she was almost two. And then when my son was born, um, I knew immediately uh, it was, it was kind of funny. So he was a very lovely home birth, uncomplicated. Everything was like, you know, easy peasy. And I didn't look at first because I was just in that birth bliss place, you know, like hanging out, snuggling my baby in my own bed. And then uh, probably like one o'clock in the morning, he was born at 7.30 at night. Somewhere like one, two o'clock in the morning, I started realizing, ah, oh, crap this really hurts. <laughs> um, you know, he would latch and it was very pinchy. And um, so in the morning I switched from postpartum mom to like, okay, I'm going to do an exam on this baby, which was very funny to me as I'm sitting there in my like depends and my, um, you know, like nursing pajamas. And I checked and sure enough, I mean, he had an outrageous anterior anterior and posterior tie. Um, mm -hmm. He had the full like heart shaped uh, tongue and everything. And I was like, oh, of course this is why this hurts. Um, but it was great because I was with this new information 
um, and all the experience I had gained in the last five years, um, it was very easy. So dealing with a tongue tie with education and information and support, we got his, his tie revised within five or six days. Oh. Um, and yeah, very fast. Yeah. We got craniosacral therapy. I have, um, a wonderful craniosacral therapist who I adore, um, who I have become friends with. And she came and did a house visit um, when he was under 24 hours old. So as we were waiting to get in for the revision, um, the craniosacral therapy really helped loosen all of those structures. So even though we didn't physically remove the tie, um, it made it manageable while we were waiting to go in. Mm -hmm. um, so I never, got to that level of pain or frustration. My milk supply never suffered. Um, you know, my milk came in beautifully. I had a couple of days that were uncomfortable. We got his ties revised and we nursed with very, very little problems. Um, and he also nursed till he was just about two. He, um, he never was the booby baby that my daughter was though. He just, he was, he was a business nurser. He took it for granted. He's like, oh, there's plenty of milk. I'm going to come in, get my milk, get out of here. Um, whereas my daughter, I felt like it was a war we went to together. Like we did it. We made it happen. Um, and yeah. So yeah, that was our, that's like the kind of slightly more expanded version of our story. So, um, so yeah, tongue tie is a very, is a topic that's very close to my heart. Um, mm. And whenever I work with folks who are going through a tongue tie experience, um, you know, you have all my empathy and I, I, I viscerally understand what it's like, um, you know, dealing with it. Uh, but I also want to offer that hope that, you know, yeah, it sucks. Like it really does. But also there's so many resources available. We're here. Um, we have great revision providers, craniosacral therapy providers in in our area. Um, you know, there's so many ways to manage it. And you know, kind of my soapbox always is that um, if someone is experiencing pain while nursing, it is it's a signal. It's a communication from your body that this is not right. And we mm -hmm. never ever ever want someone having to just put up with pain. Um, even if someone tells you that your latch looks great, um, it's only a great latch if it feels great. So if it's hurting, it's not right. Um, and there's definitely definitely things we can do and look for that um, that can help. I'm gonna sneeze, excuse me. Oh, yeah. bless you. Oh. God, excuse me. Um, allergy season. There is that idea that um, that there will be pain with breastfeeding. And then if somebody tells you, oh, it looks right, you know, then you just kind of have to suffer through the pain. But you know, there's ways around that. It shouldn't be painful. Absolutely. Um, oh. I'm sorry, let me, um, I was in construction. So I'm trying- I was to pulling up the live because I'm not seeing. Oh, there it is. Okay, great. There's our comments, perfect. Yay! Yay. Oh. Hi, friends who are watching. Yeah. Hi, Amelia. This is so fantastic. Um, great. So, let us know if you guys have any questions. So we just shared our our breastfeeding story. So since we're talking about tongue tie, um, I want I want to um, also share you know just kind of an overview uh, because a lot of times. I mean, myself included, when I had my first baby, I'd never even heard the words tongue tie. Um, and I think it's a little bit more well known now, um, but I think it's also this thing that folks get really worried about, um, you know, or like, how do I know? It sounds very mysterious. Um, so the thing is that everyone's tongues are attached to the base of their mouth, right? Like otherwise our, we wouldn't have tongues, it would have just fallen out. Um, so everyone has a frenulum um, it, and it's not even necessarily about what it looks like, um, it's about the functionality. So um, you can, I don't know, is it gross to show my tongue on a live? Is that a thing? Um, so when you lift your tongue up, you can see like everyone has a little frenulum. Um, if you have a tongue tie, that frenulum is 
is thicker and not as elastic as it should be. And it um, keeps the tongue inside um, in the well of the mouth in a way that is not conducive to breastfeeding or other things. Um, and so that's, and there's different kinds of tongue ties. There's posterior, anterior, and they may um, often present also with lip ties. And what I've been learning more about too are the buckle ties in the cheeks. That one's fairly new to yeah, me. Um, yeah. I, mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that it's less talked about with providers. I also, I'll be, I'll be straightforward. I haven't seen as many of them causing issues as tongue ties and lip ties. Um, there's been, I think I've seen like one that was really bad where like the baby basically had no um, motion in any of their um, oral structures. And I was like, oh, I get it. That makes sense. But um, for the most part, I personally haven't seen a lot of really problematic buckle ties. I don't know if other folks have. Um, but the anterior tongue ties are the ones that are really, really easy to see. Um, you'll often see like a um, a ribbon, it looks like, of, of skin going all the way up to the tip of the tongue. And those um, often can cause the, the tongue to look heart-shaped. Um, and what's happening is that that frenulum is pulling the tongue back into the mouth. And so when um, the baby goes to stick their tongue out like this, it will snap back because that um, that frenulum is attached all the way to the tip of the tongue, um, you know, or somewhere in between. So anterior tongue ties are the ones that um, really almost anyone can look at it and say, oh, I see what you're talking about. Um, and those are the ones that, you know, um, are easily diagnosed um, and and um, can frequently be taken care of very, very easily and by just about any provider. Um, there's also posterior tongue ties and those are a little bit harder. They can be the uh, a little trickier. They're often called hidden tongue ties. Um, and what that means is that the frenulum um, behind the mucosa is, um, is holding that tongue down and so you may look at a baby's tongue and not see anything, but that's when it's really important to be examining how is how is the tongue functioning. And so the things, the, um, the kind of red flags that we're looking for, um, if, we're, if we're thinking that baby might have a posterior tongue tie. So um, you may even see baby stick their tongue forward um, because a lot of times people say, well, no, my baby doesn't have a tongue tie because I can see them stick their tongue their tongue out but a baby if a baby can stick their tongue forward but not lift it that's often a sign that they have a posterior tongue tie um, and so if they can't get that good lift what's happening is that they cannot uh, make a vacuum seal on the breast with their tongue and then they're going to compensate by using their lips um, so you may also see baby have a suck blister and that looks like like a, just any other blister uh, right here on the top of their upper lip or their bottom lip. And it'll be like a little puffy raised blister. And that's happening because they're, instead of using their tongue to latch onto the breast, I should go grab my, my boob. Um, I've got my, my demo boob and my doll. I'll be right back so I can show you it on a breast. Yeah, um, you were speaking to that and it just reminded me of one of the twins um, Aaliyah had one and she would have the little blister on her bottom lip and um, our pediatrician or my, our doctor um, recognized it about like, I think a couple weeks after our, um, at our next visit. So we were able to get that revised maybe like three or four weeks after the babies were born. So it was pretty quick and I was really lucky. Um, our doctor was very, he was awesome and very straightforward and very caring. Um, yeah, but in the beginnings, I was just like, she was always hungry and I'm like, you know, she was at my breast and I'm like, what am I doing? What am I, you know, I, I kind of, I internalized it. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? Um, uh, you know, so when we found out that that she had a tongue tie, it did like, it was like night and day. Um, and I, I was supplementing her, 
um, well, both of them, you know, in between that, because you do have to feed the baby, like that is the end goal. So, um, but yeah, I, I totally remember the little blisters. And I'm like, what am I doing? My baby? But you know, it's a journey. And the more that the more knowledge you have, the more information you're able to um, get your hands on, you know, it, it helps. And I think being easy on yourself too, you know, it, it's not, mm -hmm. it doesn't happen automatically. I don't know if you're back. I can't see you. So, are you back? Oh, okay. I'm back. Yes, I'm here. Yes. I was just um, yeah, so again. I brought my breast. I, just, okay. I loved it. I was listening, and um, that was awesome. Um, yeah. So when um, when baby is latching, um, if if their tongue, so normally, um, if everything is working well their tongue is going to create a suction here as they latch onto the breast. Um, but if their tongue isn't able to do that, then they're just putting their lips here and they're trying to hold on to the breast with just their lips. And that's, it's also going to tire them out a lot. So a lot of times when we see babies who, um, you know, what we're hearing is, um, you know, babies tired at breast or they, they only nurse for, you know, a couple suckles and then they fall asleep. Um, that's another one of those things that we hear and can attune us to, to think, okay, maybe we should check that baby for a tongue tie because um, if you think about it, first of all, nursing's hard for babies. Um, it's, the, it's their only job in the beginning is to, um, is to eat. They eat, they poop, they sleep, and that's a lot of work because <laughs> um, up until then they just got to float around in the womb. So um, we take this very hard job and then it's harder because they, they can't use their tongue. So um, that tongue should be coming onto the breast and latching onto the, the breast tissue, creating a vacuum. And then that flared upper lip comes around the top and cre you know finalizes that. But when they don't have the use of, of their tongue, then um, they're having to do all of that with their lips. So it creates those suck blisters um, as well as really, really tiring them out. Um, so those are those are signs, and it hurts. So those babies often are are um, their seal is not complete. So you may hear clicking, um, and so instead of just hearing like little um, swallows, which sound sound kind of like chonk, 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 um, when they're nursing, instead you might see them frantically sort of nursing because they, they don't know what to do and they're not really latched on well. They might kind of frantically be nursing and then you'll hear like a click and that's them losing suction. And then uh, you may hear a couple chunk as they get a little bit of milk and they tr they swallow it. Um, but all of those things again are those little flags that we look for that, that, that indicate, okay, there might be something to dig deeper into to find. Um, and also that, um, so on a tongue-tied baby, we'll often see the nipple coming out flattened um, or lipstick shaped after nursing instead of coming out nice and round. So again, here we have our breast. So that nipple should be nice and round, just like a pinky finger. Um, if after baby's nursing, if it comes out like flat like that, um, that's an indicator either of a shallow latch in general. Um, so if we're not able to correct it by, by helping baby get a deeper latch, then um, that's a good indicator that we need to look deeper and look at potentially a tongue tie because they may just not be able to fully uh, latch on with their tongue. Um, so that, that flattened nipple, that lipstick shaped nipple, that's another one of those very classic indicators. And if that goes on, um, it can, it, it hurts and it can cause a lot of damage. So um, if we're seeing really, um, you know, chronically damaged nipples, that's another one of those signs. Um, and I, I wanna touch on what Mary said, that's so important uh, because I feel like a lot of us do this. A lot of moms, a lot of people who are nursing, a lot of, you know, parents, uh, we internalize these things. Um, almost every, nursing pair I've worked with, um, the, um, the first assumption by the nursing parent is, I'm doing something wrong. I'm failing at this. I have low milk supply. I'm not good enough. Like all of these things, I hear them. Um, 
And the one thing I want to share most folks is that like the far and away, almost always, it's the baby's fault. Blame your baby. It's fine. <laughs> um, no, then our babies are wonderful and perfect and they're doing their best and they often just don't have access um, to utilize their anatomy in the way that will be most effective and we can help them, and we're not doing it wrong, and we are loving our babies, and we are feeding our babies, and we are doing the best we can, uh, but when they can't move their tongue well, it makes it harder for them, and um, the other thing, too, is that uh, tongue ties don't always cause these problems, so um, I have a friend. I wonder if she's watching. April. Oh, Hope it's okay to share. Uh, anyway, so I have a friend. She's extremely tongue-tied. Um, she's an adult, and um, she can't. She still to this day can't stick her tongue out past her teeth. Um, but she nursed beautifully um, as a child. She never heard that she caused her uh, her mom any pain. And she has two kiddos um, who are also tongue-tied who nursed with no problems. I have another another friend who's a local doula. She has three kiddos who nursed with tongue ties with no pain or problems. Uh, one of them even has the full like heart shaped tongue. Um, I have, so you can absolutely nurse a tongue tied baby. It's not always going to cause pain. Um, I have, I personally, especially if it's causing breastfeeding pain, um, I lean heavily on the side of recommending revision as early as possible. Um, I know that that's like sometimes a controversial standpoint. Um, but there, I also see, I've seen many, many uh, repercussions of not taking care of it early. Um, so number one, if it's causing breastfeeding issues, um, in the long run, that's going to cause damage to mom's milk supply. So our milk isn't going to come in as fully if the breast isn't being stimulated. So if baby is not nursing effectively, the body is not getting the signals um, that you need that milk. So some people have a very abundant milk supply no matter what, like they're just milk, milk stars and that's fantastic. Um, but some people, many people, most people need uh, that, that supply and demand. So if baby is not efficiently demanding the milk, the body is like, okay, that's cool. You didn't need that, I'll make less. So uh, low milk supply is a very common um, symptom of a tongue tie because baby's just not nursing very well. So again, usually the nursing parent uh, internalizes that as I have mil low milk supply rather than recognizing my baby is not nursing effectively and so my body is making less milk. Um, and it's a really important distinction because a lot of times we see then folks um, in parent groups and whatnot saying, I have low milk supply, what herbs can I take? Or what um, you know tinctures or cookies or teas can I get for my low milk supply without recognizing the root of the problem is a baby who's not nursing effectively. Right. Um, and it's so important that we address the issue of baby nursing effectively. Um, but in addition to that low milk supply and breastfeeding challenges, uh, because then folks, you know, sometimes would say, uh, well, breastfeeding is not that important to me. I'm not going to do the, the procedure um, because I don't wanna, you know, it's hard, it's hard as a parent. We don't wanna see our babies in pain. Um, so sometimes our knee jerk reaction is to say, well, I don't wanna cause my baby pain so let's just give them a bottle or I'll pump and I'll give them a bottle of pumped milk um, yeah. and then we don't need this. Yeah. But what we've learned is that tongue ties can also cause long, other long-term uh, repercussions. If we don't, the earlier we revise it, the more likely we are to avoid some other problems. So I've definitely seen babies having uh, a hard time eating solid foods. Um, so again, if we keep in mind that baby, baby couldn't nurse because their tongue doesn't have a full range of motion. Now, some kiddos are going to get bigger and stronger and their tongue is going to gain that motion or they, they may break their frenulum. Um, it may rip on its own, things like that. Um, but it, it also may not. So we also tend to see those kiddos, um, start to struggle when they start eating solid foods. So they may have a stronger gag reflex. Because if you think about when you're eating food, 
um, you put that in, you're chewing, your tongue is really involved in that whole process. And so if they don't have use of their tongue, um, we see a lot of kiddos um, then have issues eating solid food, having gag reflex, having uh, sensory problems with eating solid foods. And then we also um, can often see problems with speech development. And then as they get older, even um, with like ongoing migraines and, and things like that and tooth decay, uh, because our tongue is also very, very active in swiping food off of our teeth and keeping saliva production going. So, um, you know, if the tongue can't do those things, there's a whole cascade of things that happen um, due to not having range of motion in your tongue. So it's fascinating to me. I'm like, wow, who knew our tongues were responsible for so much work? Right. So, so sorry, Mary, I just, I I talked a lot. Um, do you have <laughs> things to add? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to uh, hijack us. No, not at all. I love you because you, you have such a wealth of information. You've been doing this for a lot longer than me. So I'm also learning from you as well. Yeah. Um, and as you're saying this, like, um, so um, both the twins had tongue ties, but one was more, um, I guess, severe than the other one. And uh, our doctor was like, well, well, we'll just wait and see with the other one. But in, after hearing you talk about, um, tooth decay and gag reflexes. I'm like, oh, that's just, just I'm, I'm comparing the, t the one that had the tongue tie revision and the one that we were just like, wait and see, it wasn't as bad. Um, but she, I hope this is okay for her. Um, you know, she, she definitely has a little more cavities <laughs> and um, would gag a lot more like uh, growing up. Um, her gag reflex was, was very strong. <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, yeah, it was pretty bad. So now, you know, like I'm also connecting the dots with, with all that. Um, and also with your friends that had um, nursed their children with, with tongue ties. So was it, um, how were they able to be successful with that? Was it, did they, were you there to help them with their latch or was it, no, yeah, their babies are grown-ups now. So yeah. it was it's it's been funny conversations because um, you know, I've talked with them and you know, when I share my story, like, oh yeah, my daughter had this um missed tongue tie for a long time and it really sabotaged our breastfeeding in the beginning. And these two friends of mine are like, Oh my gosh, my babies are tongue tied, but we never knew it was a problem. And we, yeah. you know, we nursed and no issues, but they've had those other issues um, as the kids got bigger. Uh, both of them, their kiddos are teenagers or adults at this point. Um, so there was a lot less awareness of it, mm -hmm. you know, 16, yeah. 18, 20 years ago. Um, so yeah, they just, they were lucky in that for, you know, whatever combination of those mouths and those breasts fit together okay. And that's great. Um, but yeah, the the big picture too of, um, you know, oh, and orthodontics too. So um, if you have a um, really strong, uh, strongly tied tongue, it can pull in. So you'll often see those um, bottom front teeth caving inwards. And we'll also see like a recessed jaw. Um, and then a lip tie, if you have a, a really thick lip tie can actually, um, you know, keep the teeth from coming together the way they're supposed to in the front. Um, although I have to admit, I I think that that one's pretty cute sometimes. Um, <laughs> but, but it can be bad for, you know, again, for the tooth decay, um, especially if we have a really uh, tightly tethered upper lip. Um, it can create pockets right here. Mm -hmm. um, so the food gets stuck right there. And then um, those kiddos tend to get cavities up in the the top part of their teeth a lot more. Um, and so, and it can cause milk pooling. So a lot of times, you know, um, sometimes dentists will tell folks not to nurse their babies at night while they're sleeping. Um, but generally we don't see milk pooling on the teeth in a nursing baby because if they have a good latch, there's no milk going up on the teeth. They're, they're latched and the nipple is like actually down the baby's throat. Yeah. So a, a well-latched baby 
with a um, you know untethered anatomy, it really shouldn't be causing any tooth decay issues. Even once they have teeth, it's no no big deal. Um, what does tend to prevent uh, present a problem is a lip tied baby or a tongue tied baby. They're not nursing as effectively. So even if you have really really abundant milk supply and no issues nursing, no pain, um, you may find baby getting what is you know often referred to as bottle rot um, on the teeth um, or um, even without using a bottle because it comes from pooled milk just sitting on the teeth. Um, and that won't happen if baby's latched well, but if baby's not latching well and the milk is just kind of like flowing around the mouth, the, the nipple is not down the throat, um, and then they have a lip tie where it creates those pockets, then the milk is just sitting there on the teeth for an extended period of time. I don't remember what my point was there. <laughs> Other than that, that's another complication. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. yeah, so um, it, it is, it's interesting to see how all of these things, um, you know, come together. And like you said, like connecting those dots too. Um, oh, I was together? saying, no. yeah, so like the uh, orthodontic issue can really come up um, in the long term too. So even if we make it through um, nursing or bottle feeding. Uh, my daughter also actually had a hard time taking a bottle, uh, which we realized later down the road was due to, um, she had a less visible tongue tie. So she had only a posterior tongue tie. She did not have the anterior like my son, um, but it, it anchored her tongue so firmly in, in her mouth. She couldn't even latch onto a bottle um, so we had, um, you know, I generally recommend a really, really slow flow bottle for um, nursing babies because we want, we don't want them to um, have it, an easier time getting milk from the bottle um, instead of the breast because babies are super smart and wired for survival. So if there's this really easy way of getting milk and a more difficult way until they really fall in love with breastfeeding, we want to help encourage them. Um, like hmm, they're both hard, but this one comes with the breast. So that's cool. Um, but for my daughter, I tried giving her the slow flow bottles that were recommended and she was gagging on those too. And she couldn't latch on them enough to um, pull the milk out. So in the beginning we had to give her a faster flowing bottle even, um, because she just, she couldn't even bottle feed. Um, and we also used a supplemental nursing system. We would finger feed her with a little tube on our fingers. Um, and that was about the only way that she could really get milk at first. Um, but it was interesting because her eye was um, posterior. And so sometimes, um, you know, we'll hear from folks, they'll say that their pediatrician said it's not a bad tie, but um, really it's, it's important to recognize we can't um, we can't categorize a tongue tie on severity based on how it looks. Um, it can you can have one that looks bad and is more functional, and you can have one where you're like, I don't really see it. But if the functionality is that that tongue is not working, it needs then something needs to be done with it, even if yeah. Um, oh, and that's it. So um, that's another one of those signs. If it's not, if it's a tongue tie that isn't easily apparent, like if you can't see it going to the tip of the, the tongue. Another sign though is, you know, when babies cry, um, we, we should see their little tongue lifting up and waving around, you know, they get so mad and their tongues just go like, ah! <laughs> um, but when you see a baby with a posterior tongue tie, um, you may see it just make a bowl or like a little cup in mm -hmm. the in the bottom of their mouth um, instead of waving around like a, a regular, um, you know, a typical unrestricted yeah. tongue. Um, it just makes this cup. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's an interesting one. I know it is super cute. Everything about babies is cute. Um, but yeah, I remember I have, so I'm the oldest of, four kiddos and uh, the youngest two siblings are much younger than me. So I have a um, a brother who's 11 years younger than me and another brother who's 15 years younger than me. 
And that was a, again, should have been one of those, um, those signs, I mean, but you know, I didn't know. Um, mm -hmm. But I remember watching my daughter cry and I was like, huh, she's got this cute little bull tongue. And I just remember my brothers, their tongues just flapping around. And I didn't know that that was, yeah. like, that was a thing. Yeah, you don't, I mean, it's not something you really pay attention to unless, I guess, unless it's your own baby or, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, we had those same, um, we had those same experiences with um, twin B, the other, tw um, the one that didn't get the revision, her, hers was not that bad. So, but you know, we did the supplemental feeding as well. And I do remember having to get like every week, go to the store to get different nipples um, for her because I, I, I supplemented too. Cause you know, I just, that for a while I wasn't making enough for both of them. And then I also <laughs> pumped, so I would pump and then you know bottle feed them but yeah we were always getting um uh new nipples because they weren't and now i know why you know um yeah. they weren't coming out fast enough for her um and and it's one of those things in retrospect because with my uh, my youngest daughter um i didn't breastfeed with her i wanted to but i was um taking a lot of medication even while I was pregnant and it continued after I was pregnant. And I was just like, I, 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 I was not very educated um, on breastfeeding um, while taking medicine. And, you know, the doctors at, at the hospital, um, you know, they were just like, yeah, whatever, bottle feed is fine. Um, but I did notice with her, with, you know, like I had no problems. Like, um, you know, I, I bought all these different sets of nipples, but we, she just, um, she ended up not really needing them in the first, like her sisters did. So yeah, now um, mm -hmm. it's all like coming together and making sense with mm -hmm. it's all like just a little tongue, not, well, not a little tongue tie, but you know, just like a small, a small thing on the baby has such um, wide reaching effects. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I know it's amazing. It just, I'm always so in awe of bodies and, and all of the, you know, how important they, all these little, um, you know, structures are and, and how our bodies are so intertwined too. I mean, because I think it's, it's such an important thing to recognize too, how the whole body is involved. So we, we look at it, we're like, well, it's, um, if the problem is breastfeeding, the solution is a bottle, but mm -hmm. we're not, it's not always just that, you know? So, um, you know, the tongue plays an important role in so many things and our body is not, you know, independent pieces. It's a mm -hmm. whole, it's a whole, um, you know, um, organism and all those things work together. So yeah. if yeah, the tongue's you, not functioning, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, that's right. I know there's like a little lag, so um, it's hard. <laughs> but it's great that we get to be next to each other like this. I know, and we got it working. Thank you, Mia, at the mm -hmm. Pacific Islander Health Board. Mia and Lika for recommending this. This is this is so great. But um, yeah. Now I forgot. <laughs> I was gonna say. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'd love. I'd love. Oh, yeah, you have to really take a holistic approach to, I think everything, but you know, especially with babies and, and, and breastfeeding and, and parenthood and just, yeah, it's not just one thing, you know, there's not just, you cannot compartmentalize it. So. Right. Yeah. Zoom out um, and look at the big picture. But yeah, so it, yes, absolutely. Um, I'd love to know um, if there are folks who have any questions or having any struggles. Oh, look, I can see who's watching. Now I figure it out. Oh. <laughs> so, hi. yeah, we've got, uh, we've got Suad, Miranda, Jennifer, and Amelia are currently watching. Hi, friends. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in. Um, but yeah, so, um, Mary, do you have any last thoughts or any um you know anything oh, to add as we're about trying to wrap up um 
I don't. Yeah, if you have um, any questions, like Elizabeth said, you can type it in the chat or private message us and we'll get back to you mm -hmm. when we can. Oh, I can see it. This is so oh, cool. Okay. And I then know, I'm so excited. I'll this be thing able to at least see your rad. face on here. Play around with yeah. It. Yeah. We'll get every week. We get a little bit better at this. Um, but yeah, so for folks who are watching, um, you know, if, um, if you are needing support through your breastfeeding journey, uh, we also have our lactation lounges that are in, um, a zoom chat, uh, throughout the week. So we have, um, lactation, virtual lactation lounges right now, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, um, with our breastfeeding peer counselors. And then on Thursday is with Cami Goldhammer. Um, you know, my, my role model, my idol, um, <laughs> she is, um, a internationally board certified lactation consultant. Um, and so she does Thursdays and then on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, each lactation lounge is hosted by one of us peer counselors with, um, with a midwife. Um, so we're available, you know, throughout the week. And then on Fridays, uh, we are here streaming live. And if you have topics that you would like to hear from us about where we would love to hear that, I made a list love of it. Um, things. Oh, thanks. Um, but most important is what, what do you folks want to hear about from us? So, um, you know, we would love to hear that. Um, and Ruby, thank you for joining us. I'm so glad that you were here. Um, yeah, so I guess we'll wrap up. Um, but just know that uh, tongue tie is just, you know, it's something that, that can be um, can be fixed, it can be managed, and it doesn't have to be the end of a breastfeeding journey whatsoever. There's lots of different options, um, you know, so a revision, I, you know, my bias is I think that getting a revision done quick, um, mm -hmm. you know, early, earlier the better in a baby's life, um, but there's also other ways you know, in the meantime, too, if you're waiting to get a revision or you don't have a good provider near you or, you know, the crummy thing is that sometimes insurance doesn't cover it. So, um, you know, that can really be a barrier. Um, and there's things that we can do to work around it. So different ways we can position baby that um, can encourage a baby with a um, restricted tongue um, to nurse better. Um, there's lots of things we can do to mitigate it. So I don't ever want people to feel discouraged when they learn about tongue ties, um, you know, just knowing about them is is a huge step forward in uh, figuring out how to manage it and how to have a comfortable um, and sustainable breastfeeding relationship. All right. So beautifully said. Well, All I right. guess we will wrap up. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a great weekend, oh, everyone. Here. Uh, so we Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hold on, Mary. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Ruby had just... Hi. <laughs> so uh, we did just get a question in the chat. Um, oh, I see. So that's a... Um, Ruby, that's an idea you'd like to see us talk about. Um, hind milk and keeping baby latched on. I love that suggestion. I have lots of thoughts on the whole four milk, hind milk um, thing. So we will add that into our list. Um, but yeah, and if that's a, a burning question, um, the like two second version is, um, I would encourage you to look up Nancy Morbach, Morbacher, Morbach, um, and she has a really, really great article um, that she wrote, she's an IBCLC, um, and she, if you Google Nancy Morbach, uh, hind milk for milk, um, it's a great article, um, but basically for the most part, um, nursing our babies on demand is the best way for them to get what they need. Um, and they, there's not necessarily, well, there's, there's not like two kinds of milk in the breast. Um, it's just about getting the fat off the side of the duct. Um, and when we nurse our babies on demand, we keep that system going. Um, but, but yeah, that's a fantastic topic. So, um, oh, thanks, Mary. Yeah. There we go. Nancy Moorbacher. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm embarrassed that I couldn't remember um, exactly. But yeah, so Nancy Moorbacher, she has a really great article about four milk and hind milk, and we will add that to our list of topics, and we'll come, we'll talk about that a different time. Very cool. Thank you so much. All right. Ruby. Yeah, thank you, Ruby. We love um, having folks um, interact. It makes us feel like we're not just talking 
to space. <laughs> so, all right, thanks everyone. Uh, feel free to add comments. We'll continue to, we'll um, respond via um, typed comment once the live is over. And you, again, like Mary said, you are always welcome to message us here on Facebook or um, you know, email us through open arms, um, join us in a Zoom lactation, all of these things. We're here. All right.